I'm Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite species to use in the sport, the northern goshawk. Now, if you research birds of prey around the world, there is a number of species with the name goshawk uh, that are closely or only distantly related to the species we're talking about today. Today, we are specifically talking about the northern goshawk. Uh, scientifically, that is called Accipiter gentilis. Now, this is an odd species because it is circumpolar, meaning it lives at the northern part of the northern hemisphere. So it's in a huge number of countries all over the northern hemisphere. Um, everywhere it lives, it looks a little different. It's adapted to its environment. Um, I live in Utah in the United States of America. Where I grew up, uh, we have our version uh, of northern goshawk. Ours are one of, if not the smallest, of the northern goshawk clan. Now, our northern goshawks, like all northern goshawks, their first year of life, they're, they're cream and tan and brown with speckles and streaks and uh, marbling and feathers that uh, almost, to me, uh, especially on the chest, is reminiscent of, uh, of some of the big cats. But then, as it turns into an adult, uh, after it's a year old, it gets a slaty blue-gray back, and it gets blood red eyes that will turn redder and redder with age. And we believe this in part also is advertisement to say, hey, if you are uh, an adult, you know by the coloration, but the eyes will tell you how experienced you are. How many years have you been an adult? So in theory, this is just a theory, but the more experienced you are, maybe the better of a hunter and a provider you are if you've lived multiple years. Now the chest on the North American Northern Goshawk is gray with very fine bars. It's very beautiful, very delicate marking. This is quite different than elsewhere in the world. In the old world countries, uh, in Scandinavia, Europe, Russia, throughout Siberia, um, typically goshawks are much larger. The Finnish goshawk is the largest of the northern goshawk clan. All of these, as adults, instead of having delicate fine barring, have um, very bold, uh, thick uh, horizontal bars on the chest. And their eyes never turn fully blood red, but rather turn more of a deep orange that will get more orange with age. Now among these, also in Siberia, there is a subspecies of northern goshawk that it becomes white and is a beautiful white bird that blends in perfectly in its snowy environment. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the biology of goshawks and also what makes them a highly suitable hunting companion and also some of their drawbacks uh, as a choice for a falconry bird. Uh, but first of all, we need to kind of talk. Um, if you're especially, if you're not into falconry, you're considering it, maybe you're just learning about them. When you just say the word hawk, uh, picture people picture a miniature eagle. Now, there's two main families of hawks, the Budios, which are the big soaring hawks, and the Accipiters, which are the true hawks or the forest dwellers. Um, in Europe and in many uh, old world countries, the Budios uh, are actually referred to as buzzards. It can be a little confusing because in the United States, you hear the word buzzard and it's a slang term for a vulture. So Budios, the most classic, if you're in, in the United States, a red-tailed hawk is the most iconic Budio, a big soaring bird. It's like a Jeep or a truck. It's tough. It's, it's not the fastest some speed big broad wings for soaring and gliding and you see them perched up on trees and telephone poles surveying their landscape looking for typically rodents to eat now accipiters are the true hawks the forest dwelling hawks the goshawk is a member of the accipiter family these are quite different because instead of long wings they have very short rounded wings that produce a lot of thrust but also are narrow or are, are, are short enough to allow them to dodge branches without clipping their wingtips. Um, they also have a proportionately far longer tail than the budios or soaring hawks. Normally with birds, the longer the tail, the more maneuverable you are. So short wings, long tail, lots of speed, lots of maneuverability. Now, it's important to know these two different families. Part of the reason is, if you're just researching birds and you're looking up pictures, or if you're a bird lover, bird watcher, and you're looking through field guides, this can be a little misleading. I remember as a young child studying to become a falconer and pouring through field guides, learning all the different bird names, 
And I remember the National Geographic Field Guide opening up to it and seeing beautifully depicted goshawks. And I looked at the, these pictures, and to me, it was just a red-tailed hawk with different markings. Yes, the wings were shorter, but it just looks so robust. The problem is, illustrations in field guides are done by talented artists who have never, uh, might not have seen in person or up close or held one of these birds. So, in truth, when I first saw a goshawk in person up close, I, w I was floored. I thought it was sickly. I had no idea. Um, they are gangly, they are wiry, they are lean, they're just all sinew and speed. They're actually, even though they have incredible power with their grip and with their speed and stamina, they at, at their center are actually quite delicate birds compared to, say, a red-tailed hawk. I like to compare them to a lion versus a cheetah. Both are big cats, both are powerful hunters, but a lion chasing down its prey, it'll just, I'm going to overpower you. Where cheetahs, yeah, they are powerful killers, but they're actually quite delicate, and they have to sit and wait and stalk and run down their prey, trip their prey, push them down because they don't have retractable claws, they're highly specialized, and if you get a slight sprain to, a, to, a, to one toe, a cheetah's dead, where a lion's like, ah, I sprained my toe, I'm going to tough through it. So again, if that helps you, um, maybe some of their dimensions might measure out the same, but try to think of a, of, of a, of a red-tailed hawk as a lion, not by size, but by build, and think of a goshawk as a delicate, highly specialized cheetah. It's important to remember that. So um, in the wild, goshawks will hunt both mammals and birds, but what they are known for is their ability to hunt birds. Uh, you, um, in falconry, anything from the size of a sparrow to, in some cases, as big as a goose. Geese aren't normally taken as regular prey, but the word goshawk is often reported to come from the term goosehawk or goosehawk because it's a hawk that you could actually use to take down full-sized geese. So, they are amazing in their ability to chase birds, and these are incredibly athletic performances. Um, it's not just a direct pursuit, although they can do that. It's up and down and side to side. Um, it's just it, mid, mid air, like this is real. If you had um, a falcon chasing a bird, maybe that bird's flying away and the falcon's going after it. When they know they're being pursued by a goshawk, a bird shifts into a new gear and they do these insane maneuvers that you would never even believe are physically impossible for a flying animal. Now, remember, goshawks are built for a forest dwelling lifestyle. A forest is a dangerous place to go fast because you're gonna run into branches. And if you're focused, you know how a lens works. If you focus on something distant, then the, the things closer to you disappear. Like if you take a photo through a chain link fence, if you zoom right, you can make the chain link fence disappear. If you make a tiny branch disappear from your field of vision while you're pursuing prey, you're going to crash. You're going to injure yourself. So even though all birds of prey do have incredible vision and they all do process visual information more quickly and rapidly than we do, if you ever get a chance to work with a goshawk and compare it to other birds of prey, you will find that the frame rate that it processes information is so much more rapid. Uh, and you see that exhibit in their hunting, but even their behavior on their fist. If you're holding a goshawk and it twitches and moves and looks around, it'll just... and the only thing I can relate it to, you know if you look at a propeller or a ceiling fan and it starts to blur together or props on an airplane are spinning and then all of a sudden they seem like they're going backwards, you're not picking up every bit of visual information. Goshawks pick up far more of that. And so they're edgy and twitchy, uh, but they can safely fly through forests, crash right into brush without hurting themselves physically. Now, in falconry, a goshawk has a long rich history of use in the sport in multiple countries. Now, that is in part because of their high success rate. So before I mention that, old world goshawks in Europe, in Russia and Siberia, Scandinavia, Asia, old world goshawks tend to be nicer than North American goshawks. It's important to know that. All goshawks have a little bit of an edge, or a little, a little intense, kind of crazy, uh, and can have some issues. The old world ones are nicer. 
Uh, I like to put it, if you've been in falconry a while, think of if you put a little bit of a dose of red-tailed hawk or a little bit of a dose of Harris hawk into a North American goshawk, that's the old world goshawks. A little nicer and in my mind, a little more manageable. So in Asia and in Europe and throughout Siberia, throughout Scandinavia, goshawks were one of the earliest birds used in the sport of falconry. In some countries, it was their first species documented to be used in the sport of falconry. And that is, of course, because falconry emerged originally as only a way to get food. So whatever bird is the most practical obtainer of food is going to be the best choice. Over time, it evolved into a sport, into entertainment, and a love of the birds themselves, and even a status symbol. But a goshawk is a great choice if you're just trying to get food. So um, they were often referred to, you'll see this in the literature all the time, they'll be, oh, they're referred to as the cook's bird. And the idea was that a cook or an innkeeper could go out in the morning, catch several rabbits, catch some hares, catch uh, some ducks, maybe a partridge, bring them back a bag of game, literally a bag full of multiple animals captured and be able to provide for his restaurant or to be able to provide for the people staying at the inn. You make up some food. Um, we live in an era of groceries, so that can be hard to relate. But uh, because of its um, reliability in obtaining food quite easily, it was also used extensively in uh, by knights. Um, now, knights were wealthy, just like royalty, but royalty had free time and they weren't necessarily charging into battle, where knights had some free time, but they were going to battle. So if you're going to a foreign country, going to war, bringing your hawk with you, not so much as a status symbol, but as an obtainer of protein in between battles, is a good choice. A falcon is not the best choice. Falcons, you're training them to circle high, circle around you, dive down and attempt to catch, knock a pheasant out of the air. They are amazing hunters, but in medieval Europe, flying a big falcon was every bit as much about enjoying the spectacle as it was trying to get food, where a goshawk was more just, I am getting dinner. And so knights uh, use that. And also similarly, uh, the equivalency of knights such as samurai throughout parts of Asia, uh, when you have a caste system, those who went to battle would, uh, but were high up in the social totem pole, would often have a goshawk. Now, even they, this is sounding pretty good. This is sounding like this might be a good bird for me. Well, let me tell you a few things about them that are 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 need to be considered, need to be factored in if you're considering this bird. Uh, first of all, this is not a beginner's bird. It takes in intense detail to weight management. And if you watch some of my other videos on weight management and food, um, this is a bird that there's not always a magic number. A fat bird wants to be lazy. A skinny bird is not healthy and can't, can't chase. But depending on the temperature, this is going to fluctuate. This is, you have to always be attentive to the weight management hunting a goshawk. And if you're off, you could have them in poor health or even die, which you don't want. You also have to remember that they are comparatively delicate in their build. Even though, again, they have those tendons that have so much grip to pull their toes and their wing beat is so strong and powerful, they are still rather delicate. And you do have to be more attentive with their upkeep, with their equipment and their management than you do with something hardier like a red-tailed hawk or a Harris hawk. Their feathers are surprisingly breakable. I have noted that old world goshawks seem to have less breakable feathers than new world goshawks in North America. Um, but either way, they all do have breakable tails in particular. And this you shouldn't be an issue, but they are reckless hunters. Their pursuit, they're willing to charge right into the brush, charge through trees. They don't care. They're tenacious, uh, but that can result in broken feathers. Um, also, when they are mantling over a kill, once they've caught something, or mantling over a lure on the ground, if you throw out a lure, uh, they are prone to jam their feathers into the ground. So it is good. A lot of falconers will use a tail protector uh, that could be made out of many different materials, but that folds the tail in and safely has it bound together when they're on the ground on a kill and when you're transporting them to reduce that. That's a pain. That's a lot of extra work and thought something you need to be aware of. They are a bird that can range and disappear. Also, that could be hiding in a bush right in front of you and be totally still and disappear. Because of that, 
telemetry is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, eventually you will lose your goshawk. So if you're thinking of beating a goshawk, there's an extra expense right there is getting radio telemetry or GPS telemetry. Now, uh, goshawks are incredibly susceptible to asper, which is a spore, a fungus that can get in their lungs and take root quite easily. So if they're overly, and asper is everywhere. I'm breathing it in and out right now. It's all everywhere. There's circumstances that heighten the growth of asper spores, but it's always in the air. We're always breathing it in and out. So you have to be much more cautious though with a goshawk because they are prone to getting a, a respiratory infection and dying from asper spores in the air. Now, goshawks love to bathe. They need to bathe regularly, daily, uh, which means whatever housing you have set up for them, you think that's easy. Well, let's provide a bath pan. But most goshawks are extremely private. They're nervous. They're twitchy. They're always on edge. Something bigger is going to eat me. And so you have to make sure that not only do you provide water, but that you station perches or covers or walls in a way that even shadows aren't spooking them to the point that they won't bathe. They need to bathe regularly to be healthy. If they don't get that enough, it can be very, it, it can, it can throw off in funny ways. I had one goshawk where I had a great mew for him to live in and I had a great perches, great bath dish, but there were, um, there was shadows that would keep him from wanting to bathe. So he wasn't bathing, even though we had the water available. And then whenever I would be out hunting, then he would, uh, anywhere he found water from a sprinkler or anything, he would go and he would bathe in that strangely rather than doing it at home. And it wasn't until I realized why this was happening and switched him to a different mew that didn't have shadows moving past that he was fine. So that's an extra consideration that you don't necessarily have to bother with with other birds. Um, if you imprint a goshawk, if you do it incorrectly, your goshawk can be tremendously violent, a dangerous bird that you should not hunt. Um, there's a lot of publications about how to train an imprint goshawk to get them to be social imprints rather than food-based imprints. Um, because one of the problems that happens is the babies, as they're growing up, they're th their mom's bringing food, mom and dad bringing them food, keeping them fat. They're growing very quickly. And then at a certain stage, <clears throat> mom and dad start feeding them less intentionally and the babies are getting hungry. This gets them to start to jump up on tree branches away from the nest to get their footing, to learn balance. And they're doing that to try to be the first one to mom and dad once food arrives. Uh, eventually, mom and dad start bringing wounded prey and flying near the nest and the babies are so hungry they fly and mom and dad will drop the prey and the babies will catch it. So, <clears throat> so mom and dad do weight management on their own offspring to lower their weight, to induce hunger and urgency. And they teach them the very early basics of hunting. But after a certain point, those babies are becoming so aggressive, mom and dad leave and it's time for the babies to go off on their own and learn how to hunt on their own and hopefully survive. If you get a baby and you are mom, the food bringer, and you never leave, you now have this violence out there. I'm supposed to direct this, but you never left. And so this is where problems can happen. Um, it's such a potential for an issue that uh, wonderful falconer Mike McDermott even wrote a book called Acipitrine Behavioral Problems, a book I highly recommend that tells you how to work through some of these problems if they've come up. And uh, But it is a consideration. It, um, if you train a goshawk wrong, things can go very badly. So again, a goshawk is an amazing hunter, but not a beginner's bird. And another one of these birds that um, even if you are a general or a master class falconer, it is still a bird that if you're going to train, I recommend you find somebody who has already trained one that you can pal around with, bounce ideas off of, discuss, and learn how to have the best experience possible with your goshawk. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's, it's, it's a brief introduction to goshawks, but I hope it gets you thinking. And um, I would like to do more videos about training goshawks. If that is something that you would find of interest, please uh, leave a comment down below so I know if that's worth investing the time and effort to demonstrate. And I um, hope you enjoy the rest of my videos on my channel here. And as always, happy hawking.